So welcome back to those of you that are uh, returning participants. I hope everything's going well for you and that you're staying healthy. Um, we've got a couple questions uh, that I sent out earlier and hopefully we have some other discussion going. So new FinTrack guidance is coming into effect uh, June 1st of 2020. Um, so part of the guidance relates to clarifying reasonable grounds to suspect. Uh, I'm wondering if the effects of the economy have shaped anyone's ideas um, and will this clarification be sufficient um, is, or is there perhaps a clearer example globally that might help to shed some light? I think to some extent there's there's always going to be nuance in terms of what's reasonable grounds and I don't know that we're ever going to get to a place where it's exactly the same because so much depends on on those facts and contexts that come around it and I'll give you a really funny example um, with a client of ours when we did a review we had a question about just the sheer number of beneficiaries that they had so you would have one person who might be sending to 15 different people um, and to me that was a huge indicator uh, for this business that did a lot of remittance that was related to a particular uh, religious holiday where people would send just small amounts of money so they weren't big amounts of money they were small um, but there would be these small amounts of money that were sent to um, various relatives and they did. The, the thing that I thought was really good is they actually captured the relationships between each of these beneficiaries and the sender and so it was clear to them that, that this made sense. Um, whereas I, I think for a lot of other businesses if you saw that you would say in no universe does that make sense. So there's always going to be some nuance depending on what it is that you're actually doing. And I, I think like so many things in compliance, it comes down to document, document, document. So when you have a situation like that where it's something that's unusual or that's going to look unusual, if someone's on the outside looking in, you have to have that explanation documented somewhere. It, it, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I, you see institutions that um, have not documented it and they wonder why no one else understands or you see someone that's even submitted a report and and they don't understand why no one sees their side but it's because they haven't explained it well enough uh, their intentions with it right um, so uh, Dev and I were speaking previously on this because the UK's regulator defines it perhaps a little bit in more detail um, but um, I noticed Dev your audio is back up so I'll let you speak to that and then um, uh, we can go back to Amber's point about finding that balance Yep. Um, is, it, is this better? Yes, it's much be, better. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, one of the settings. Again, I need to change the defaults. Um, okay, yeah, just a bit of background um, for the UK. So um, what we have here, we have something called the Joint Money Laundry Steering uh, Group, JMLSG. It's a, um, it's, a, it's a body made up of trade associations uh, from different areas of finance. And what, what this body does is they issue guidance uh, whenever there's a, a key update to regulatory uh, changes and particularly they cover uh, money laundering reporting things like that um, especially around um, reasonable grounds as we mentioned and um, what exactly is suspicion so they more or less give you a specific enough guidance of what is suspicion um, and what is knowledge so if you had knowledge of money laundering uh, where you were 100% could confirm it or where you just had a suspicion and what they define suspicion as is um, it falls short of proof but um, it's beyond mere speculation that's what the guidance says um, and this same guidance um, also covers reasonable grounds and they uh, well, essentially you could be held in the UK criminally liable uh, if you should have had reasonable grounds and you didn't uh, file a SAR, let's say, a suspicious activity report, as they call it over here. And what they say for reasonable grounds um, in the guidance is uh, based on the particular circumstances of, say, the transaction or the customer, just like Amber mentioned as well, that it, there are nuances and it depends on the situation. Uh, here, they, they essentially expect you to look at uh, the circumstances of the transaction or the nature um, and 
if you should have been suspicious, were you? So that, that's kind of the test, if you will. Um, and, and you can be held criminally liable where um, they call it the reasonable person test or something, where would, a re- would, 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 would the, the average person off the street, was there enough there that you should have spotted that you didn't? Uh, either you turned a blind eye or you acted without due sca- skill and care, let's say. Um, and Dev, do you think you've seen that? Um, perhaps you've heard of it either in the news or once a court case has gone through. Um, it, that would seem to me sort of hard hard to prove from a legal standpoint. So you've got, you're saying, would a reasonable person do it, which is which is a pretty good metric for most reasonable people. <laughs> so then so then once it goes to the courts, what um, have you had anything like that where you've where you've seen it come through and they've actually used that um, uh, as a measure? Maybe not direct this I might be off this is off the top of my head now. Um, but there's I don't know if you if anybody's familiar with the HSBC versus Shaw case. Mm-hmm. That, that's a quite a, a big case where um, uh, HSBC froze the funds. Um, that's a separate story in itself in the UK where if a transaction hasn't taken place and you know it is and you know the more or less specifics of it, did they have sufficient uh, rationale, if you will, for blocking these funds? Um, and it was uh, proven in HSBC's favour in the end, which was a very big, big relief. To back that up a little bit, though, I'll give some insights. Whenever I used to train AML investigators, I used to always say, um, you've got your guidance from JMLSG, the, um, the National Crime Agency issue guidance on writing good SARS, what they look for. Um, one thing I used to always say is, um, back up anything you say with uh, really good rationale of why you think uh, there's money laundering going on here or what your reasons for suspicion are. Um, but equally, um, show your rash, uh, show, show your thinking. I mean, it doesn't have to all go in the SAR. Um, even if you keep case notes, that could prove very helpful in the future. If uh, it was ever questioned, you can show how you came to that conclusion. That's amazing, and that, that's what uh, Amber you were saying about being able to document exactly what had um, transpired there. So, anyone else around the room with experience with international regulators, and uh, when you're filing any sort of suspicious transaction reports, how clear that regulator is as to what is expected? Yeah. So um, back in Dubai, um, I think um, I had I had a case which was a kind of a funny case, and. Uh, um, and we had uh, it, it was the beginning of the Ozark uh, TV series, and uh, we had the new client, which uh, was based in BBI, set up in BBI, and the name of the company was Ozark. Probably they could have selected a better name for for the company, and then uh, the client came back saying that oh. Uh, I kind of, um, you know, selected that because Oz, the name of our dog, and Ark, that means protection, and that's the reason why I chose the name Ozark. It was really hard for me to believe that. That started for me as, uh, let's say, the ground for suspicion to to kind of say that, okay, why, why did you select something which kind of associated with a series that it's about money laundering? So you probably need to think about renaming your your company. So I brought it to the to the regulator. That's awesome. Did the, did the regulator ever respond to you in any way, like acknowledging that um, your other concerns and the name and um, or or do they offer feedback to you? Um, they asked me to document everything and uh, uh, raise the flag and you know report that. Mm-hmm.